On June 4, 2019, a chilling call rattled the Randolph County Sheriff's Office. Butch Smith, Linda Collins's son, dialed in, frantic. Days had slipped by without a word from his mother. Worried after days of silence, Butch and his grandfather went to check on her, only to find a tarp weighted down by a brick in the driveway. As he lifted the tarp, he was met with two unsettling sights. A horde of flies swarmed out and his mother's decomposing body. We've been trying to find her for the last few days, almost a week, and we've not heard from her. And what is your name, honey? Butch Smith. I'm her son. We came to do a wellness check at her house. I think I found a body. Okay, honey, we'll, we'll get an ambulance out of that way, okay? The nation was stunned by her sudden and suspicious death. Who could have killed Linda Collins, and why? The search for answers began in a frenzy. In this video, we delve into the shocking case of Linda Collins, brought to you by Tainted Tales. Linda, known for her roles as both a businesswoman and a Republican member of the Arkansas Senate, was facing a significant transition in her life at this point, having recently lost her position as an Arkansas state senator and navigating through a messy divorce. Linda returned to her small hometown of Pocahontas, Arkansas, a quaint city in northern Arkansas with a population of around 7,000 people. Moving out of my office today, I just want to say how humble I am to be your senator, how proud I was to serve you. That's the way I voted as your conservative senator. And in Pocahontas, Linda found solace in managing her motel businesses and cherishing moments with her grandchildren. As she embraced this new chapter, she also began dating and exploring opportunities for lobbying jobs across the United States. Grandchildren. A promising prospect in Washington, D.C. led her to journey there for an interview on May 27. Following what appeared to be a successful meeting, Linda shared the news with her daughter, Heather Tate, via text. A few days later, Tate excitedly messaged her mother a snapshot of her latest shoe purchase. However, this time, there was no reply from Linda. Though Tate initially brushed off the lack of response, recalling her mother's mention of upcoming busy days, a sense of unease started to settle in. With each passing day void of any word from Linda, Tate's concern intensified. Tate resided near Little Rock, another Arkansas city approximately two hours away from Pocahontas. As the date approached when Linda was expected to be in Little Rock for the Arkansas Music Awards, Tate grew increasingly worried. With her mother's silence weighing heavily on her mind, Tate decided to reach out to her brother, Butch, urging him to conduct a wellness check on Linda. On July 4, 2019, two men approached Linda's house, her son Butch and her father. Despite Linda's truck being in the driveway, there was no response when they knocked on the door. Peering around the house and through the windows, everything appeared normal. Butch, lacking his own key, watched as his grandfather, Linda's father, attempted to unlock the doors. Surprisingly, both the doors of Linda's truck and the back door of the house were unlocked, a departure from Linda's habit of always securing her vehicles. Entering the house, still undergoing renovation, they called out for Linda, searching every room and closet without finding her. However, in the kitchen, they encountered a large stain darkening the floor. At first glance, it could have been coffee, considering Linda's habit, but the possibility of it being blood couldn't be ignored. Regardless, it was evident that something had gone awry. After thoroughly searching the house, they exited through the front door. As they left, Linda's father detected an odd odor emanating from the driveway near Linda's truck. Beside the vehicle, construction materials were piled under a tarp. Curiosity peaked. Butch ventured to inspect beneath the tarp. Upon lifting it, he was met with a swarm of flies and a nauseating stench reminiscent of decomposing flesh. Beneath the tarp, Butch discovered his mother lying face down her arms stretched above her head and wrapped in a blanket. Shocked, he instructed his grandfather to stay clear and physically blocked him from approaching. With urgency, Butch dialed 911 to report the distressing discovery. Have y'all been inside the home? Yes. Yes, we have. We'll wait till my sheriff gets here, uh, but yeah, we're gonna need in there. Okay, so there's gonna be something up with this. Uh, we are gonna need CID. The sheriff's office swiftly responded to the scene, soon joined by the Arkansas State Police. Before Sheriff Kevin Bell commenced his investigation inside the house, he made several observations outside. Noticing mounting brackets on the walls, he recognized their purpose, to hold cameras. However, 
the absence of any cameras suggested they had been removed. Additionally, on the walkway leading to the house, a broken plastic hair beret caught his attention. Upon entering the house, the most alarming discovery was the large stain on the rough wood subflooring. With a trained eye, Sheriff Bell realized that this was no ordinary coffee stain. Upon the arrival of the Arkansas Mobile Crime Lab, they conducted an examination of Linda's body, determining that she had succumbed to multiple stab wounds. Adjacent to the stain on the kitchen counter, they found a Clorox spray bottle with a smear of blood on the nozzle, suggesting an attempt to clean up the scene. Despite this evidence, there were few clues to construct a timeline of events. The absence of forced entry suggested that Linda may have known her assailant. It was evident that she was attacked in her kitchen. Her body later wrapped in a blanket to minimize mess before being moved outside and concealed under the tarp. To piece together the days leading up to Linda's death, investigators turned to her inner circle of family and friends. Conversations with Butch and Tate revealed details of her job interview in DC and subsequent disappearance. Additionally, they spoke with Tim Loggins, one of Linda's closest friends, who had served as a state corrections officer for 28 years, along with his wife, Rebecca O'Donnell. Becky initially served as Linda's personal assistant, but their relationship evolved into a close friendship. When questioned by investigators, Becky recounted picking Linda up from the airport after her trip to DC, but struggled to recall details due to misplacing her phone. I'm lost without my phone. Bless your heart, I bet you I, I think I have some screenshots in my texts of her flight. Tim recalled a call between Becky, Linda, and himself during the drive home from the airport, where Linda mentioned being too tired to discuss the trip further, planning to catch up the next day. The following day, Linda texted Becky to bring lunch to the house, leading to an argument over Linda's new boyfriend, Rendell Wallace, who had spent the night and left in the morning. Despite Becky's subsequent attempt to reconcile, another argument ensued during a phone call. I went out there and she told me all about the night before because the man out there, Rendell, spent the night with her. When I left, she was mad at me. Why was she mad at you? That's what was button in her personal life. She was talking about how the night before it had taken Rendell like four hours to get, respond to her text and calls. This is before he came over, I'm yes. assuming. Okay. And she was kind of upset about it. And I told her she had no right to be upset. She needed to slow down and take it easy and get to know him. That would make her mad. I would say, well, maybe. Linda does not like. Well, she's a senator. She's just right. telling people what to do, not being told what she to really do. Is. She really is. You know, she was wondering if he had been with somebody else, and that's why he wasn't responding. And I just told her she was going over the top. You need to just stop. With this information, investigators turned their attention to Rendell as the next person of interest. The Eagles and had a few drinks and danced because we love to dance, me and her both. So we hooked up and we went down there and danced and wound up spending the night in Jonesboro at a motel. Okay. Investigators discovered that Rendell wasn't exactly a newcomer in Linda's life. Prior to marrying her ex-husband, Phil Smith, Linda had been involved with both Phil and Rendell simultaneously. Eventually, she chose to commit to her relationship with Phil. However, just a few weeks before her untimely death, Linda and Rendell rekindled their connection and quickly bonded. They frequently enjoyed dates centered around their shared love of dancing. During Linda's trip to DC, she also visited Arizona to celebrate her birthday with her cousins. While there, she messaged Rendell, inviting him to join her, but their plans fell through. Upon returning home, Linda invited Rendell over for the night, which proceeded without incident. However, despite Rendell's attempts to contact Linda throughout the week, he received no response. The detectives encountered conflicting accounts from both Becky and Rendell. Becky claimed that after their argument, Linda spent more time with Rendell, while Rendell stated that he last saw Linda kissing her goodbye at the doorstep before her argument with Becky. I said, what are you doing? I said, I'm laying here on the couch watching TV. And she said, why don't you come over? I said, I'd love to. And we hugged and kissed, and she let me out the door and locked the door behind me. I went out the patio door. Oh, just a minute. Okay. So she walked you out, walked me out, the patio door? Yeah. The couple said their farewells, and Rendell proceeded to text Linda several times throughout the week, but was met with no response. But I thought, well, she's just in meetings, you know, down in Little Rock, you know, she'll get back to me later on. And then 
I never heard anything from her since. This disparity raised questions about the truthfulness of their statements, adding complexity to the investigation into Linda's death. Another person of interest that emerged was Phil Smith, Linda's recent ex-husband. Phil, an attorney and municipal judge in Pocahontas, played a significant role in Linda's life, especially as a father figure to their children, Butch and Tate. Initially viewed as a power couple due to their successful careers and joint ventures in motel ownership, their marriage eventually became more transactional than romantic after about a decade. After 23 years of marriage, the couple decided to part ways, sparking a contentious settlement case over the division of their assets. As the legal battle intensified, bitterness between Linda and Phil escalated. Linda made a significant accusation against Phil, alleging that she had caught him watching pornography on his state-provided computer in his office. Leveraging this accusation, Linda gained an advantage in the divorce settlement. Phil's actions led to an investigation by the Judicial Discipline and Disability Commission, which concluded that he had improperly used court computer equipment outside of regular work hours. As a result, Phil faced consequences and was effectively barred from serving as a judge in Arkansas. Despite this setback, Phil emerged from the divorce with a significantly larger payout than Linda. However, Linda appealed the decision, prolonging the legal proceedings for another potential 17 months, adding further strain to an already tumultuous situation. The prolonged and acrimonious divorce proceedings between Linda and Phil presented a plausible motive for Linda's murder. With Phil's career and reputation tarnished by the accusations made against him and facing the prospect of extended legal battles, the strain on him was considerable. Another potential year and a half of court battles could have pushed him to a breaking point, providing a compelling motive for taking drastic action against Linda. She got screwed. Phil got almost everything. Here's the kicker. Linda appealed it. And when the judge says that could be another 17 months, Phil just collapsed. Oh my God, is this never going to end? During the investigation, a crucial piece of information surfaced. Butch and other close individuals to Linda disclosed that she harbored fear towards Phil. Family. I'm going to tell you another thing. Linda was scared to death of him. Scared of Phil? Of Phil. Linda was deathly afraid of Phil for whatever reason. Everybody I talked to says she's scared to death of Phil. She is. She felt scared that he was going to do something. Do you think your mom's scared of your dad? Was yes. scared of dad? Yes. You do? Yes. You I really believe there was a fear there. It wasn't an act, it was a fear there. I fully believe, firmly, firmly, with all, everything, believe that she was afraid of. In the early 2000s, Linda sought medical attention due to feeling unwell for an extended period. Blood work revealed an alarming level of mercury in her body, prompting concern. While there were various theories about the source of the mercury, considering Linda rarely consumed fish, its presence remained perplexing. Without a clear explanation for the elevated mercury levels, Linda became convinced that Phil had deliberately poisoned her, adding another layer of suspicion to their already strained relationship. Fearing for her safety, Linda took proactive measures against Phil, including changing the locks on her doors and installing a comprehensive security system with the assistance of Tim and Becky. The system featured numerous cameras positioned strategically around the house, providing Linda with remote access via her phone or laptop. Tim didn't hesitate to express his suspicion to the police, openly suggesting that Phil might be responsible for Linda's death. What do you suspect then? Uh, her ex-husband killed her. Really? Phil? Yeah. Sheriff Kevin Bell reached out to Phil, who flatly denied any involvement in Linda's murder during their phone conversation. With the case garnering public attention, Phil went as far as issuing a written statement to NBC News, vehemently refuting the accusations against him. He specifically addressed Linda's allegation of poisoning, stating that he was not aware of such an accusation and categorically denying any involvement. Despite extensive questioning of Linda's inner circle, including Tim's outspoken suspicions, investigators struggled to find concrete evidence amid the swirling rumors and accusations. Linda was a part of our uh, weekly Bible studies and uh, we had great interactions uh, with her. And it's a privilege and a pleasure to, with her, her family and friends and her. Oh, Father God, um, thank you for the folks that have turned out this morning and showing love for Linda. Linda had a poor set of values that made up with who he was. He read them out and stood firm on, firm on them no matter the call. She was the same person behind closed doors as she was outside. And we were out of pocket. 
and Linda was dressed in her red suit with her red lipstick on. She was animated. She was passionate. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Between the first and second memorial services organized in the state capitol and locally in Pocahontas, Tate took it upon herself to conduct some investigation. She managed to gain access to her mother's email, which was linked to Linda's home security system. Whenever motion was detected by the cameras, Linda would receive alerts. While sifting through her mother's inbox, Tate discovered that on the day her mother was likely murdered, there were several alerts. Tate promptly informed the detectives, who then attempted to access Linda's security system account to review the camera footage. However, they encountered a setback. Someone had logged into Linda's account on the same day as her murder and deleted all footage from that day. It was apparent that the individual responsible for deleting the footage was likely the same person who had removed the cameras themselves. Following the issuance of subpoenas and search warrants, the detectives contacted the company responsible for Linda's security system. Two days later, a package arrived at the police department containing a flash drive with all the footage stored in the cloud from Linda's cameras. As the police diligently reviewed the footage, visitors began to arrive at Linda's second memorial in Pocahontas. Aware that the killer was likely someone close to Linda and might attend the service, the detectives knew they had to act swiftly. As they scrutinized the footage, a timeline leading up to Linda's death began to emerge. They observed Becky's brief visit to Linda's house to drop off lunch, followed by a blood-curdling scream captured by a camera near the garage three hours later. Later that night, footage from the same angle revealed someone returning to the crime scene, concealing themselves under a white sheet. Continuing through hours of footage from various cameras, the detectives struck gold. It transpired that even after being removed from their mounting brackets, the cameras could still operate using battery power. One of these cameras, thrown into the bottom of a bag, captured none other than Becky O'Donnell holding a knife smeared with blood. Through the hours of footage from multiple different cameras, they finally hit the jackpot. It turns out that upon removing the cameras from their mounting brackets, they can still operate using battery power. After being thrown into the bottom of a bag, O'Donnell put in a large knife in a purse. Detectives say she took Colin Smith's cameras but forgot to delete some of the video. Hours after the murder, this nighttime video outside Colin Smith's home the detectives weren't entirely caught off guard by Becky's implication in the crime. Since their initial interview with her, they had harbored suspicions. Despite Becky's emotional display during the interview, the absence of tears raised a significant red flag. Moreover, inconsistencies began to surface during their investigation. While Becky had allowed access to her phone records to assist in establishing a timeline, it was discovered that she had actually used her phone during the time she claimed to have lost it. Becky, do you have a home phone? No. Used to sell? Yeah, I lost that today. You lost it? Furthermore, disparities arose between Becky's statements and those of Tim, another key figure in Linda's life. Tim asserted that Becky had been visiting Linda's house nearly every day since her disappearance, yet Becky struggled to recall which specific days she had been there. As the investigators delved deeper into Becky's background, they uncovered troubling information, suggesting that her involvement in a murder plot wasn't an isolated incident. In 2007, Becky faced accusations of plotting to have her now ex-husband murdered after a friend alerted him to her offering $50,000 for the deed. Becky explained to the police that she was intoxicated and not serious about it, but no charges were filed due to lack of evidence. The investigators later shared their suspicions with Butch and Tate, though none of Becky's past actions or inconsistencies could explain her motive for killing Linda. I talked to Tim and Becky, and, and I gotta tell you something, Butch. Um, there's things that ain't adding up there either. I felt like for a while there was something fishy between the two. I'd never heard of these people until divorce time, and all of a sudden they were all up there in the business and helping move furniture and do stuff, and I never met these people. Before. As the detectives delved deeper, Butch and Tate revealed that in the weeks leading up to Linda's disappearance, they noticed unusual withdrawals from their grandfather's bank account. My grandpa just recently started seeing money coming out of his account that he didn't authorize. My mom wouldn't just take from my grandpa. This is not something that According to Becky, Linda entrusted her with managing all financial matters, including signing checks on her behalf. However, detectives discovered that Becky had been embezzling money from Linda's father and her motel business for months. Believing Linda had been unaware of the financial discrepancies due to her frequent travel, Tate informed her upon her return from Washington, D.C. This confrontation with Becky likely escalated into a fatal argument, leading to Linda's demise. Becky. Rebecca. 
Rebecca O'Donnell's day began in a Lawrence County jail, leading to this, her first appearance in her Randolph County hometown, Pocahontas. After her the investigators acted swiftly to intercept Becky before she could reach the memorial service. With the green light given, police pulled her over and arrested her right outside the service. Becky was then taken to the police station for questioning. I bet you sit right here. I'm gonna lay it all out there for you, okay? You're under the rest of the murder. You understand that? We got you. We got you. We got video of you. You didn't erase the mob. We got claims into what led troopers to arrest a woman now convicted of the murder of a former Arkansas state senator. A Pulaski County judge ordered Arkansas State Police to release a large portion of the file after a lawsuit filed by KRK and other media outlets earlier this year. KRK 4's Mitch McCoy has been following this case since day one. He's in the studio tonight with a look at the file, what we're learning, and we're learning quite a bit. Yeah, this is just the first batch of this massive case file. We're, we've been told some 20,000 pages, so the first glimpse really telling into what state troopers had when they were called to this scene. After months of negotiation, prosecutors offered to drop the death penalty if Becky pleaded guilty. Before accepting the offer, Becky's attorneys reached out to Tim and had him sign a non-disclosure agreement. They wanted Tim to hear the truth before Becky pleaded guilty. Devastatingly, Tim learned that Becky had indeed killed Linda. However, the shock grew when news broke that Becky had confessed to her cellmates about orchestrating a murder-for-hire plot to kill Phil and his new wife. Allegedly, Becky promised her fellow inmates gold and silver from Phil's home as payment. O'Donnell tried to get several of her fellow inmates to murder Linda Collins' ex-husband, Phil Smith. That never panned out because those inmates went to investigators. And as they talked, investigators learned that O'Donnell admitted to appearing on camera, bloody knife in hand. But she claimed that knife was for a chicken and that investigators doctored the video. To corroborate their claims, the inmates provided authorities with a fake note Becky had written, intending for them to plant it at the scene after Phil's murder. Becky ultimately accepted the plea deal, confessing to both the murder-for-hire plot and the intentional murder of Linda Collins. She admitted to intentionally killing Linda and concealing her body afterward. Rebecca O'Donnell was convicted and sentenced to 50 years in prison in August of 2020. Spoke, uh, just a, uh, a couple hours ago outside the courtroom, uh, after learning that Rebecca O'Donnell, you see her right there, she's wearing a bulletproof vest, is walking to a police car, uh, pled guilty to first degree murder and abuse of a corpse. Uh, this was. For the first degree murder charge, Becky was sentenced to 40 years, along with an additional three years for abuse of a corpse. Additionally, she pleaded no contest to two murder solicitation charges in Jackson County each carrying a seven-year sentence. These seven-year sentences ran concurrently with each other, but consecutively to the 43-year sentence for a total of 50 years behind bars. Williams. Butch Smith. Uh, today, Rebecca O'Donnell pleaded guilty to killing my mother, to abuse of my mother's body, and no contest of solicitation to commit capital murder. Today, our family has found swift justice by way of a plea deal. We know that there will be some who are not satisfied with that outcome today. And we realize that no matter what punishment Rebecca O'Donnell receives, it will never be enough. It will never bring my grandpa's daughter back, or our mother back, or our children's grandmother back. No amount of punishment will ever fill that void that Rebecca O'Donnell made in our lives the day she killed our mother. Today, we find some shred of peace that Rebecca O'Donnell will be put away in prison for a very long time, unable to hurt anyone else. If my mother was here today, I have no doubt that she would quote the Bible and tell us that we can find peace in God. We know one day that Rebecca O'Donnell will have to answer for her sins before the judgment seat of Christ. In Romans chapter 12, verse 19, it says, Dearly beloved, avenge not yourselves, but rather give place unto wrath, for it is written, Vengeance is mine and I will repay, save the Lord. While our efforts of seeking justice on earth may fall short in our eyes, it is guaranteed by God that justice will be fully served swiftly and justly when we are called to answer for our sins before him. Thank you all again for your thoughts and prayers for our family during this case. We want to again thank the Arkansas State Police and the Randolph County Sheriff's Department 
for their hard work. Without your efforts, this case would have not been solved so quickly, but also for keeping our families safely, keeping our families. Some of you at your local would remember me for managing the hotels or when I was out in Mom with uh, uh, some of the political events over the years. I would like to say that what happened to my mother was an awful deed. It was carried out of hate, jealousy, and greed. I believe that Rebecca O'Donnell was stealing money from my mother, and when my mother confronted her about it, she snapped and snapped my mother to death in a fit of rage and perceived self-preservance. As some news agencies have already reported, I was the one that found my mother's body on June 4th, 2019 at her home. She was lying face down, wrapped in one of my old comforters, and shoved underneath the tarp in her driver. I will never not be able to see that picture burning my brain. The smell of a dead body laying outside wrapped up in that, in that tarp for approximately a week in the Arkansas summer. The swarm of flies that flew out and surrounded me. The sight of her white blonde hair moving because a number of maggots crawling on her scalp. The last memory of her that I have was of me making a 911 call and trying not to comment at the sight and smell of my mother's body. My thought on the conclusion of this case is that none of the punishments allowed for Arkansas state law will come close to what I feel right now and as a right and equal punishment for her. The plea deal is not what my first choice would have been, but at least we do have a guaranteed amount of time that she'll be in prison for, and we have the ability as a victim's family to argue against her release at every parole hearing. I'd personally like to thank the lead investigator, Christian Hutton, of the Arkansas State Police, the Randolph County Sheriff's, Kevin Bell, and everyone else that worked their butts off to make sure no stone was unturned, that no piece of evidence was overlooked, and that the safety, security, and privacy of my family were first and foremost during the entire investigation. Thank you all for your well wishes, the happy thoughts. The amazing thank you for tuning into this video. Don't forget to like and subscribe for more captivating content. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out the one displayed on your screen. Click, and I'll meet you there.